now. Welcome everybody to the online seminar series, Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. So we have the pleasure of having today Emma Freyenje. She's an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science and Operations Research at the University of Montreal. She's uh, the holder of the Canada Research Chair in Demand Forecasting and Optimization of Transport Systems, and also the holder of the Canadian National Rail well, company chair in optimization of railway operations. Her areas of research include both demand forecasting and optimization of uh, transportation networks, uh, and in particular handling uh, large scale uh, problems. Her research has appeared in leading journals in the fields such as um, computer and operations research, European Journal of uh, operational research and transportation science. And her students and herself have won several uh, international awards, including the prestigious uh, uh, Transportation Society Dissertation Prize uh, given by the Inference Transportation Science and Logistics Society. She has uh, realized numerous uh, projects in collaboration with public and private actors, and she uh, works part-time as a certificate advisor of Ivado's Labs, and she's the founding fellow of AI Sweden. So great to have you today here, uh, Emma. Uh, the floor is yours. And for the audience, remember that uh, if you have very, very urgent questions, please put them in the chat, and I will read them to Emma. Otherwise, uh, there will be time for a Q&A session at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Norris, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation. I've assisted some of the talks, and I've seen the lineup of the of speakers that you have in this seminar series, so I'm quite honored uh, to be here. Um, I also see a few names of people I know in the participant list, but I haven't seen in a long time, so hello to everyone. Uh, thank you uh, to everybody for joining this. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to um, talk to you about the uh, metaheuristic for two-stage stochastic programs. And I guess I, uh, Doris invited me here uh, to this particular uh, seminar series because it is a topic at the intersection between machine learning and operations research. Um, but here maybe I will mostly say that we also need uh, uh, machine learning, but it's really at the intersection between the two. Uh, so I wanted to start out before giving you the outline of the talk. I was going to sort of uh, give a brief motivation for, for this work and also sort of narrow down what is the uh, scope of the contribution or the work that I'm going to talk about later. So in terms of motivation, um, I work on transportation problems, mostly some supply chain problems. And I find these fascinating. Um, and they are also good candidates for uh, methodologies, I believe, between machine learning and operations research for several reasons. I think many of you have heard even like in the media and the, the public are now aware of uh, the importance of uh, having uh, robust uh, um, systems in terms of supply chain and transportation. And this became very uh, uh, I think visible during the pandemic that our systems can be quite fragile. Um, the characteristics of the decision making problems underlying these are that they are hard to solve, hard because of the combinatorial nature and because of their large uh, scale. Um, many of these problems occurring in transportation and supply chain are subject to uncertainty and quite a lot of uncertainty. Um, some of my favorite problems really concern demand and demand is typically very hard to predict. So there is a relatively large degree of uncertainty surrounding demand. Um, and what is interesting is that most of these problems, even if we look at tactical or strategic planning problems, they are sort of repeatedly solved over time, right? So think about sort of uh, scheduling problems. You might do a, a plan for a schedule that is going to be in place for a period of time, and then it's re-optimized. But typically, one would solve sort of similar instances. Demand can change, some other parameters can change, but it's sort of resolved over time. And I think this is really the key aspect that makes them uh, good candidates for, for machine learning. And I'll get back to that. 
Um, so in order to narrow down a bit and show you what I'm going to talk about specifically today, I first wanted to take a step back and look at, uh, at least from a practical point of view, what is sort of the decision making process or how are we looking at the different problems that are intertwined when we're solving these uh, transportation or supply chain problems or even other um, types of decision making problems occurring in, in practice. So typically, um, the, the, the prediction uh, tasks are dealt with uh, separately, right? So one would have data, one would train sort of machine learning models, typically supervised learning, to make point predictions. And then uh, we can leverage those point predictions in deterministic models of an optimization problem that we want to solve. And we'll solve this optimization problem and at least the problems I'm interested in in transportation, say network planning, there would be human in the loop, right? So somebody would look at these solutions and say, okay, I can implement the solution as is, or I'm going to make some tweaks to it and then implement it in practice, which means that it's actually occurring sort of an interaction with the physical environment, which generates new data and so forth. And there is actually a lot of sort of um, opportunities to improve this process, in particular trying to sort of uh, better inform the prediction tasks about the downstream optimization task, uh, taking into account sort of the perception of the decision maker in, in this process, and also taking into account how the data is generated. And this uh, becomes particularly important when there is uncertainty in the system, right? So when there is uncertainty in the systems, these point predictions that we have uh, can lead to unexplained variations. The optimization problem in their stochastic or robust or distributional robust variants become a lot harder to solve. And so they're just from a solution point of view, they are, they are challenging. Uh, but also it is challenging to take into account sort of the perception of decision making in this context because when faced with uncertainty typically they are not risk neutral and so they need sort of interpretability both on the prediction side and on the optimization side and possibly risk averse solutions and uh, having uncertainty also means that it's quite hard to anticipate what is going to happen in the future, which could potentially lead to this post decision disappointment. So this is sort of to look an overview of the challenges that are in. And I just wanted to mention that um, what we're going to look at is really exogenous uncertainty here. Uh, in this talk, but if uh, we have endogenous uncertainty in the sense that our decisions can impact the distributions of the, of the uncertainty, um, uh, then uh, all of these aspects are even more challenging to deal with. And I would say that this is not studied a lot in the literature for now. So uh, with that uh, sort of motivation or introduction in mind, what we're going to really narrow in in this presentation is on the optimization scope um, and uh, stochastic problems, right? So what we want to do is to be able to solve faster um, uh, stochastic, so challenging stochastic problems. And um, as a final sort of remark before getting into uh, more of the talk, I borrowed this slide from uh, Neil York Smith. Um, he took sort of um, uh, uh, the tree, one could say, um, that is part of this paper here by Kotoria et al. Um, that shows a bit what is sort of going on at the intersection between uh, combinatorial optimization and machine learning, where you can see sort of on the right hand side what we refer to end to end combinatorial optimization learning. Uh, com learning. So trying to sort of um, uh, avoid the use of solvers at the prediction time or at inference time and trying to predict solutions uh, um, directly. Somewhat related is decision-focused learning, which I will not have time to go into details today, but which is a super interesting and important topic. And then on the other side here, on the left-hand side, you have sort of try using machine learning to uh, augment solvers of combinatorial optimization problems. 
And we are situated more here on the left hand side. Um, most of the work that has been done uh, at this intersection are uh, dealing with deterministic problem, which we are not, we want to deal with stochastic problems. And also there has been a lot of research, uh, very interesting research going into sort of augmenting MIP solvers with machine learning algorithms. Um, and keeping, while well, keeping these, um, uh, the method, overall method exact. Um, here, on the other hand, we're going to uh, look at heuristics ways to speed up um, uh, the solution using um, MIP solvers. And we're going to focus on two stage stochastic programs. I put sort of, so the, this uh, orange blurb is sort of my addition to Neil's nice uh, scheme. Uh, and I put this intersection because for me, these are really not two separate branches. Uh, what we're going to use is some prediction of solutions or at least a, a solution value when we're doing this. And what Neil added, which I think is nice, are uh, these two uh, black uh, um, boxes on the top, um, which also is at the intersection between machine learning and, and optimization, where either uh, we augment uh, um, machine learning with combinatorial optimization, or that we try to learn models uh, using machine learning, so really re learning, uh, say, feasible space uh, and so forth. So what we are situated is uh, in this area here. Okay. So um, the outline of the talk is going to first, I'll give some background referring to, uh, to a paper we wrote a while ago, where essentially we're investigating whether we can predict useful um, information about second stage problems in two stage uh, stochastic formulations. Um, and then I'll go into sort of the background and the motivation of what I'm going, what's going to be the main uh, scope of the of the talk, which is solving integer linear two-stage stochastic programs. And our particular focus is on problems that have uh, relatively hard second-stage problems. And uh, then I'm going to describe uh, at the relatively high level um, the algorithm that we propose that we call MLL shaped, where essentially we're going to address computational bottlenecks in the classic L shaped methods uh, with machine learning. And then I'll spend quite some time on the, the numerical study um, that we did and essentially shows that we can gain speed ups uh, up to uh, 6 to 167 times compared to an exact method and where our optimality gaps are very close to zero. Okay, so just as the background information, then looking at this uh, first question, which is sort of a very important prerequisite for what we're going to do later. And the key motivation here, at least for me, so the problem that I have in mind is really to do uh, uh, tactical planning. So solving, let's say, network planning problems for transportation, but where we want to take operational uh, decision uh, problems and their constraints into account. So you can think about, uh, so I work a lot of rail uh, transportation. So there it could be, you know, fleet management and service network design problems. And we need to take into account um, operational terminal operating, um, uh, operational problems at terminals, let's say that are in the form of, of bin packing or routing problems. So this means that sort of the second stage problems are relatively hard. And so what we wanted to do here is to take such problems and look whether we can uh, predict some descriptions of these uh, solutions um, under imperfect information. And uh, for the purpose of learning, we're using sort of a large number of deterministic problems, right, that have been solved independently and offline. So we want to sort of gain speed up in the way we are generating data. So we're just looking at them as deterministic and we're hiding the information that is not available at the time of prediction. And we uh, want to um, use machine learning to learn sort of how to um, how to predict well the information that we need under imperfect information, and we use supervised learning for that. 
And in terms of uh, application, what we use uh, so was one of my favorite problems from the railroad, um, uh, which is um, uh, load planning problems. So I'm going to use this to illustrate what I mean with descriptions of second stage problems. So if you look on the upper side here, you can see that I have a problem instance. And here I just describe it by saying I have three rail cars, okay, one with three platforms one that is a bit larger platforms and smaller so they have different characteristics right and i have a set of containers and they have different colors to say that they are all having their individual characteristics and if i were to solve the load planning problem what it would give me is what i refer to as an operational solution so it will tell me exactly which of the containers i can load on which rail cars and how they should be loaded so each container has a specific position on the rail cars the type of operational solution is crucial to have for the operations, but if I want to solve, let's say, a tactical planning problem, I usually don't need all of this information, right? And moreover, I have, uh, don't have perfect information about the characteristics of the instances most often. I don't even know, say, the detailed container characteristics. I would only know their size and so forth. So if I look at the tactical perspective, which are the two bottom lines here, maybe what I can have is information, like I said, now you don't see the specific colors of the containers anymore. So let's say I've only separated them in terms of size. And what I might be interested in knowing is either like how many I can load on each rail car, how many of each type, or like even at the even aggregate level, just knowing which are the rail cars I'm going to use and which are the the containers that can go on a set of rail cars. So these are sort of descriptions of this operational solution, but at a more, uh, at a less granular level. And this was what we set out to do, uh, is to try to predict these characteristics. And the applications that we had in mind was sort of problems either on the network planning side uh, or on, um, on capacity management, so booking control type of problems. And so uh, the answer to the question uh, that I set out to investigate is yes, we can actually predict with um, high accuracy uh, different uh, types of descriptions of these uh, solutions. And the prediction accuracy is actually close to a uh, lower bound that we could compute with uh, using a sample average approximation. And we can generate these predictions in milliseconds. So very, very fast. And this is very useful, right? Because now it means that I can use those predictions as part of other algorithms. And this is what I'm going to talk about in this in uh, right away. Um, and what we wanted to do is sort of when we're using this is to predict directly sort of the expected uh, uh, solution characteristics or the expected value of a solution without needing to generate uh, uh, scenarios or without solving costly problems. And uh, doing these sort of predictions are easy in practice. Um, if one has access to data or can simulate data, the only thing that we used was sort of used was standard supervised learning and a general purpose solver. And so if you want to know more about that work, uh, it is published in uh, IDOC. So um, what I'm going to talk about now is sort of if, if we take now, let's say we have these uh, prediction oracles that can uh, give us information about problems, can predict them in very short time. How can we now leverage this to solve uh, two-stage stochastic programs? And here the end goal uh, that I have in mind is obviously to be able to solve like large scale problems that we are not able to solve now, but uh, that are very important in in practice. So uh, think about so what I'm thinking about is um, uh, network uh, planning problems for transportation, but maybe you have others of your favorite problems uh, in mind. Okay, 
So now uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, two-stage uh, stochastic programming. And like Dolores said, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, ask questions or interrupt me if you need clarifications. Um, you should be able to follow this part without really following the maths, but I put the maths on the left-hand side. For those of you who are familiar a bit with these uh, approaches, um, you should be able to recognize the notation and maybe get a bit more in detail what we are doing. But if you're not, um, you should be able to follow um, anyways. Okay, so um, here uh, we're looking at uh, what I was saying, stochastic, two-stage stochastic. Um, and uh, what we're focusing on is when the second stage problems are relatively costly and when they have integer variables. And this can occur, for instance, um, uh, so costly can mean, for instance, due to a high uh, number of scenarios. So there can be a high level of uncertainty. And in transportation, this is most commonly the case uh, due to uh, demand information. So here is a notation quite standard. Uh, we borrowed it from Angulo et al. in 2016. So you're seeing either the two-stage stochastic uh, in the sense that this Q uh, of X, so this is, the, I guess, the only notation that is important to keep in mind. It will get back. This Q of X is the value of the second stage problem, right? So here on the lower sand, you see the second stage problem, which is subject to uncertainty psi. Uh, the uh, second stage variables are y, and we're assuming that we have integrality constraints on y, and that we have binary coupling variables, um, because we're using the L-shape method later. Um, and so here you can see these uh, second set of constraints um, involves a theta. Theta is up here, so at the optimal solution, this is going to be tight and q of x equals to delta. Uh, in order for this to be feasible, it has to be less than or equal to zero, or uh, q of x needs to be less than or equal to theta. So, um, this work, um, so there are different works uh, that have focused on trying to solve these problems. Typically, uh, one would like uh, to solve these problems when Q of, uh, it's not too costly to compute Q of X, but this is not always the case. Um, in terms of exact methods, it was seminally addressed in La Porte and Lovaux from 1993 with the integer L shape method. So what I did here is just to write uh, the classical form of the first uh, stage problems. Now you can see uh, here we added the lower bound on theta. So L is the lower bound and we added these constraints. And these ones are going to be added iteratively in the branch and bend uh, approach. And uh, uh, a family of constraints uh, of this type is the integer L-shaped optimality cuts that were proposed in Laporte and Nouveau. They have this shape. We don't need to go into the details of the L-shape. If you know the method, then you know why this looks like this. What is important for this particular uh, talk is to see that in order to compute these cuts, we need to evaluate the value of our subproblem at each candidate uh, solution. So we have these ones depend on Q of X, right? And so these ones, there are two observations. These ones uh, are costly to compute because we need to solve these integer uh, programs. And on the other hand, um, they are only cutting one infeasible solution at a time, right? So in uh, more recent work by Angulo et al, they made this observation and said, well, actually, uh, what we can do is that we can check and check uh, feasibility using uh, continuous relaxation first. The continuous relaxation is less expensive to solve. So that, why don't we add uh, sort of a block uh, in the algorithm before by computing the continuous relaxation and if we identify an infeasibility, we're going to add uh, continuous L-shaped uh, cuts, so subgradient cuts uh, of this form here. And these uh, are uh, hopefully stronger than these integer L-shaped cuts. Okay. 
And one would only add the L shaped cuts if we are not adding these ones, right? And uh, what we can observe in terms of these uh, is that now we need to uh, compute uh, on the one hand, the continuous relaxation, which should be a lot faster to solve than the integer sub problem. And we also need the solution to the dual of the uh, LP relaxation. Okay, so uh, what we uh, wanna do now is to say, okay, uh, this speeds it up, and it's uh, it's a really nice uh, work of Angulo et al. Uh, they managed to really speed up the L-shaped method. Nevertheless, um, we're still restricted in the size of problems that we can solve, and the type of problems at least I am interested in are not uh, sort of tractable with this approach. So what we wanted to do is to tackle the computational bottlenecks of, this, uh, of these algorithms while keeping the same structure of the algorithms. Okay, and we tackle the bottlenecks with uh, machine learning. So uh, why would one use machine learning for this? And so I go back to what I was uh, starting out this presentation for is that uh, many of the hard decision-making problems that we're solving in practice are actually sort of solved repeatedly over time. And so when from somewhat similar uh, problems or problems that are a bit different, but one could uh, say sort of uh, come from, uh, from a distribution of instances. So this is sort of the key motivation for, you know, um, why it would be worth uh, pushing some computation offline to gain uh, speed online, right? Um, and so uh, what we're looking at is these both sort of variants of the L-shape methods. So the standard L-shape method and the one with um, alternating cut strategy. And so what we need to be able to compute are these two uh, sets of cuts. And what we're going to do is to replace these costly computations that I'm showing here in, in orange with fast machine learning predictions. So in order to use the standard L-shape method, uh, we would need to sort of predict the subproblem uh, value. And what we would need in order to use sort of these continuous L-shape cuts is that we would need the relaxed subproblem value, and we would also need the solution to the dual of the relaxed uh, subproblem. Now, uh, one note here um, is that we actually don't need uh, all of the dual variables. Uh, we only need those that are occurring here. So um, we can actually rewrite uh, these cuts in this way. And this can lead to uh, quite an important reduction in dimensionality of what we need to predict with machine learning. So this is a as a parenthesis on the technical details of the approach, OK? So how does this look like? So um, I put on the left, I hope it's more or less readable, but I'm going to explain to you what I mean. So now you're in a branch and vendors cuts approach and we are now in the callback. We are replacing sort of an exact uh, callback of the L-shape uh, method with here an heuristic one, right? So now what we're doing is we're looking at uh, sort of the block that um, goes with the standard L-shape method, which you would start by sort of computing usually the, um, the value of the subproblem. Now we are computing it with a prediction, right? Um, here's just some technical detail on the um, on the implementation because this is done on C uh, on GPU while the algorithm and sort of we are using CPLEX, it runs on CPU. So we compute this prediction. Um, and then we need to decide whether we are going to add these uh, L-shaped cuts, right? So we need to check um, uh, if uh, this condition is satisfied or not. So recall that in order for the solution to be feasible, Q of X needs to be less than or, uh, or equal to theta. Now we're using predictions, right? So we might have some error in here. So what we're doing is that we're adding um, a shift coefficient here, which sort of uniformly shifts uh, our prediction. So we don't want to overshoot. 
uh, if we overshoot our prediction, it means that we might uh, erroneously uh, uh, reject the feasible solution. So we can shift these predictions downwards and mu here is zero if there is no shift and otherwise nothing larger than zero, but uh, uh, less than one, okay? So this is for uh, the block where we would add uh, uh, for the uh, standard L-shaped. And now we can do the variant with the alternating cut, which essentially, as I explained earlier, adds a block before uh, this second block, which is the standard L-shaped. And here we would check uh, uh, the condition, but with respect to uh, the relaxation instead. So the tilde here uh, shows, uh, denotes the relaxation. And we add the shift coefficient very similarly to what we did um, in, the, in the second block. And we also have, so here we have uh, more predictions to compute. So recall that here we would need uh, some of the dual variables uh, in addition to the value of the uh of the relaxed uh, subproblem okay so then a few questions uh that one might have is so obviously this is not an, no longer an exact uh, method but can we guarantee that we find the feasible solution uh, so we cannot do this on the fly <coughs> uh, but uh, we can obviously identify if um, uh, we terminate without a feasible solution. And this, when it would occur, would probably occur pretty fast. Um, but then we can use uh, these values of the shift coefficients to uh, in the multi-phase variant, right? So if you end up with uh, no feasible solution, you can use increasing values of mu and nu, and you relaunch the procedure uh, to find the feasible solution. Now, in all of the instances, and we saw the very large number of instances, um, this happened twice, in which case uh, we increase the value of these in phases. And so the computing times that I'm going to show you later involve those multi-phase uh, uh, variants in their computing time. We also tried two other, um, uh, two other variants, sort of one that is exact, we would just use this in a heuristic way to give us um, a solution. And then uh, we would do a second phase where we warm start with that solution. It didn't turn out to be competitive in terms of computing time. A second one uh, that we did was to uh, uh, use uh, the warm sort. And we also add sort of a probabilistic lower bound. And this also turned out not to be uh, uh, working uh, as well as the others. <clears throat> okay, so a few remarks. Um, so um, learning to predict um, Q of X um, is a lot easier than learning to predict uh, also the uh, um, the values of the of the dual solution, right? So the standard version of the L shape is actually easier from a, a machine learning perspective. The whole idea of sort of using this first uh, block uh, in the exact version was to avoid computing uh, Q of X, which is the most costly. But uh, in the machine learning version, the predictions are very, very fast, right? Independently, if there are those associated with alternating cuts or the integer cuts. Um, so they are in the order of a few milliseconds, and they are invariant with respect to the number of scenarios and also with respect to whether it's one or the other task. So this would then a priori favor sort of the um, integer L-shaped method, uh, except um, if the master problem is relatively hard, because then we would expect that the cuts of the continuous cuts to be stronger than the integer ones, and then it could be valuable to have this other version. And we will see later um, that this is indeed the case, that there can be cases even for the MLM shelf, um, that warrants sort of the alternating cuts as opposed to the integer L shape. 
Okay. So some general remarks on the on the machine learning side. So what we're doing is obviously we need data, right? And so uh, what we're doing is that we are parameterizing the instances such that we can have a distribution of uh, problems that are of, of interest. And then we randomly sample from those. Uh, we need to define the input output structure. And I already discussed sort of uh, uh, some of those aspects, right? We want the output structure to be as small as possible. Um, and uh, we need to compute solutions, obviously, offline to generate our labeled data for supervised learning. There are two ways that we can do this uh, labeled data. Um, and here we're using the results uh, of the other paper that I briefly mentioned in the beginning. So either we can solve uh, the sub problems over all of the scenarios and compute uh, uh, the Q of X as it was defined earlier. This is relatively costly, right? Because we need to solve these uh, many of these sub problems. Or we can do as we did in the other paper and just solve for each scenario independently and give to machine learning. We lose a bit of accuracy, but this is a lot less costly from uh, uh, from a data generation perspective. OK, so now uh, to our numerical study. These ones are not on transport and network um, planning problems. Here, what we did is to use benchmark instances uh, used in the literature to see whether we can actually beat uh, the state of the art uh, using our algorithm. So the problem uh, classes come from Angulo et al. There are two uh, uh, classes, uh, two, uh, two families of problems. So the stochastic server location problem and the stochastic multiple binary knapsack problem. So in terms of SSLP, uh, it's defined for, so it's uh, to locate N service. So I'm going to use this notation, SSLP parenthesis, the first term is the number of service. Uh, servers. Uh, the second term is the number of customers, and K here is the number of scenarios. Okay. Um, the first stage of this problem is relatively easy, but the second stage is relatively hard. So this is sort of the fit, best fit for our algorithm. In terms of the uh, SMKP, um, the second stage is relatively easy, so it's less of a good fit. We expect our method to be maybe less performant on this one, and it is confirmed, as you will see later. Um, and the first stage is relatively hard. So what we did is, out of all of the instances that were used uh, in the literature, we say, let's see what we can do with the very hardest ones, right? So here you see the two this one's on SSLP. <coughs> Sorry, I managed to catch COVID, so I'm not usually sounding like this. <coughs> so uh, uh, SSLP, uh, here we have 15, 45, and 15 uh, scenarios. And so what we're doing is that we're creating even harder instances. So we're increasing by uh, an order of magnitude the, the number of scenarios in here to make them even harder. And then there is one here that has even 2,000 scenarios. And for SNKP, um, uh, these are two. Uh, the last one is really the hardest, and there was no solution found in previous work. But there are only 20 scenarios of these ones, OK? Uh, these are some uh, details on the uh, on the input output structure, and what I want to note is that in terms of mean absolute error, um, we have a very low error uh, on the predictions for the L shape standard L shape method. It's slightly higher when we're looking at the alternating cut variant because this is a more difficult task from a machine learning perspective. So uh, before entering the details, I wanted to give uh, the key takeaways. Um, so in terms of the SSLP, we managed to get speed ups between 11 to 167 times compared to the exact method. 
And uh, in terms of solution quality, we have average optimality gaps of less than 2% with medians uh, that is basically zero. So in terms of the SSLP, with the type of problems that we focus on when the second stage problem is relatively hard, we have a very good performance. In terms of the SMKP, here we're using the alternating cut variant of the MLL shape because uh, the first stage problem is hard. So here, this one outperforms sort of the standard um, uh, method, even when we're using machine learning. We are six to seven times faster than the exact method. But when we're comparing to another heuristic, so here we have a basic version of the progressive hedging algorithm, that one is actually eight to 14 times faster than our MNL shape. And I get back to um, why this is so. Uh, in terms of solution quality, uh, we are very good, less than 0.08%. Progressive hedging is also doing, this basic version is do, also doing really well. Uh, we are slightly better, but these gaps are still very small. Now, what is important to keep in mind is that our method uh, uh, online is invariant with respect to the number of scenarios. And this problem has very few scenarios in this, in this uh, version. So let's look a bit more under the hood on the SSLP. Um, so here I'm just restating the same uh, uh, takeaways as I said earlier. Here you see an order of magnitude of the computing times in seconds. You see hours are really fast. You have the exact, which are significantly longer. And here you can see that this basic version of the progressive hedging is actually not uh, doing uh, really well. It's even slower than the exact method on several of these instances. In terms of optimality gaps, here you see the details, the average and the standard error of the optimality gaps. Um, this second line here is a bit interesting. Uh, this one indicates, um, you remember when I talked about the generating the data, either we can sort of you know, generate the data with the best possible labels, so we're solving the subproblems, or we're just solving the scenarios independently, and the second row corresponds to that, right? So we're losing something in terms of accuracy when we are doing that. So we pay the price in terms of gap. Um, so uh, the optimality gap here is slightly higher, so it's uh, we're significantly higher, it's 2.6% on average, um, but uh, we are gaining uh, um, a lot in terms of speed of generating data. If we uh, go uh, even further into uh, the details a bit, so on the upper graph here, uh, or table, you're seeing the number of integral second stage problems. So remember the exact version here is the alternating cut uh, um, of Angulo et al. So the objective is to try to reduce the number of integral second stage problems that are solved. Um, with the MLL shape, we're using just the standard L shape, right? So we are going always to add integer L shaped cuts. We can see that if we just take the example on the first row, we're solving on average 420, say, of these integer second stage um, uh, problems, but we're predicting their value. These are approximately the same number as the number of relaxed second stage problems that the exact algorithm is solving, right? So the exact algorithm, because of this alternating cut strategy, saves on the number of integral second stage problems that they're solving, and they're solving more of these relaxations, right? And the relaxations are much faster to solve than these integral ones. Now, so where is the speed up coming from? And here, and here is really where you see the gain of using machine learning predictions. So now you're seeing the total time spent in the integral second stage problems in milliseconds now. Um, and here we don't take into account the parallelism that can be used by CPLEX. So um, uh, just to uh, as a remark. So here we are spending on average 630 milliseconds in the integral second stage problems by predictions. But if you look here on the total time that the exact method spends on the relaxed ones, it's several orders of magnitudes more, right? So this is really where uh, the gain of the of this 
uh, in speed is coming from. It's really due to the machine learning prediction. On the SMKP, as I told you, uh, the uh, uh, improvements are a bit less ex um, impressive when it is compared also to alternative sort of uh, heuristics. So we are getting a speed of, of between six to seven times, but actually a, a basic version of progressive hedging is doing better. And there, there is no learning, right? So there is like no additional data that needs to be generated and training and so forth. So from a first look, it might seem like it would be better to go with uh, this type of algorithm instead of of doing a machine learning based one. But what is important to keep in mind is sort of the number of scenarios and the fact that um, the MLL shape is in, invariant with respect to the number of scenarios when we're looking at the online computing time. So uh, we just increased the number of scenarios from 20 to 2000 and tried solving it with uh, this basic version of the progressive hedging again. And then we can see that the uh, computing time is increasing, right? As opposed to this computing time with our method, which would remain the same online if uh, you're using more scenarios. So in other words, the gain of doing the training or it's worth it if the second stage uh, problems are relatively ha hard, otherwise it is not uh, worth doing the learning. So um, in conclusion, and I think I'm, I'm on that, um, our idea was here to use the structure of existing um, algorithms uh, that are classic in operations research, but really addressing the computational bottlenecks with the machine learning. And what we show is that this can actually lead to large reductions in computing time. Uh, compared to exact, but also uh, to existing um, heuristic methods. Uh, importantly, like I mentioned, the online prediction time is invariant with respect to the number of scenarios, and we managed to get high quality solutions. Um, there is a first version of the paper available on archive. You have the link here, um, or like the number, um, and it's uh, under minor, minor revisions for informed journal of computing. So there are a bunch of, uh, I mean, future work that we can do. Here. Uh, one that we are definitely working on is solving uh, uh, really much harder uh, problems. Um, but we're also looking into sort of sample efficiency and being able to um, <clears throat> uh, uh, reduce sort of the data requirements, uh, maintaining high accuracy for the machine learning uh, problems. This was all that I wanted to say uh, today, so I'll just take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, for the great presentation. Um, so for the audience, if you would like to uh, pose questions, please raise your hand and we will give you the rights for the camera and the video. Yes, so we have Mateo. So Jason, could you please give the rights to Mateo? Hello, Emma. Actually, I just wanted to take the chance to say you hello. It was a nice talk. Thank you. And I have to question now. So uh, I, I, I get that you compute the gap with respect to the exact solution of the second stage, is it? When you, uh, those are the results that you showed us. So do you think that at a certain point, when you do the machine learning uh, estimation of this value and you're not satisfied, uh, you can trigger uh, an exact solution for just uh, one iteration of the cap generation. I hope that the question is clear, but anyway, I just wanted to say a lot to you. <laughs> Yeah, very nice to uh, to hear your voice, Matteo. This was a long time ago. Uh, thanks for your question. I'm not sure I got what you said. So because I, it was uh, jumping a bit in my ear in the beginning. So you're saying that we are comparing to exact. Uh, I'm I'm not sure I got uh, your point. Yeah, actually, the gap that you showed in the results was it. 
Okay, the results. Yeah, these are the gap are with respect to uh, because we know the optimal solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, at a given moment, would you somehow uh, switch from the estimation you do with machine learning uh, towards a an exact method for the second stage if it's not satisfactory? Would would it be possible? Ah, uh, if so, the yeah so the the tricky part uh, so i'll try to rephrase what i what i heard maybe i didn't get your question correctly but let's say that if uh, the machine learning uh, uh, predictions are not good enough could we switch to an exact is that the yeah the question exactly. yes yeah so actually this is this is tricky right because we have no way of knowing when we're sort of doing the predictions and checking the feasibility and adding the cuts we have no idea of the quality of the solution the only way of knowing it's like we can get so let's say we are overshooting the the value so we have a sort of a positive bias then that's sort of the, the riskiest because then we could cut feasible solutions, right? At worst, we can even end up with no feasible solution, right? And we can cut off uh, good feasible solutions. Ideally, we would like to detect this, right? But uh, at this point, we have no way of detecting this. The only way to know is once you have sort of terminated your branch and vendors cut, um, you could end up with um, uh, no feasible solution, in which case you can use the shift coefficient. You can identify if you have an important bias um, on sort of offline, on other data, in which you can already shift your predictions to be on the safer side. But every time you shift uh, your predictions, you're going to pay a price potentially in computing time, right? Did I answer your question more or less? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matteo. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? I think it was all uh, very interesting and clear, uh, Emma. So I think we will uh, close here and thank you again very much for uh, uh, the great talk. And to the, to the audience, uh, we would like to remind you that next week is actually the end of our uh, season five of the online seminar series. And uh, yeah, we will have a talk from uh, Jose Ramon Subizarreta. And uh, if you would like to join the mailing list to receive news from us, uh, please do so. And you have the QR code there. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and yeah, uh, see you uh, next week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma, and get uh, well soon. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure to, to, to listen to your talk uh, here in the online seminar series.